Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to op-ed.tv. It's been eight years since the terrible economic crash of 2008 threatened to throw us into a depression. We're still limping through a seemingly endless recovery period, and the memories and scars from that crisis are still raw. A compelling new book tells us, incredibly, that our policymakers and the business community haven't learned very much at all from that long and terrible experience. The book is called Makers and Takers, The Rise of Finance and the Fall of American Business. And the author is the brilliant economic columnist for Time Magazine and global economic analyst for CNN, Rana Faruar. Rana, welcome. Thanks Thank for you. coming in. Thanks for having me. So this is a really scary book. <laughs> That's what everybody about says. <laughs> we go through all that horrible period in 2008, and here it is eight years later, and you tell us that the the financial system in the U.S. is still not properly regulated and that we're still vulnerable to major shocks and further crises. Yeah. So how can that possibly be <laughs> after everything we went through? Yeah, well, you know, it's been a 40-year period leading up to what we went through in 2008, and that's what my book's trying to cover. Basically, my book is trying to change the narrative that we had after the 2008 crisis, which is um, we got to bail out the banks. If we can just make the banks okay, the economy's going to be all right. It's all about these too big to fail banks. Well, we saw that we bailed banks out. Right. Uh, the markets went to record highs. The real economy stagnated. Wages stagnated. We're still in the longest, weakest recovery of the post-war era. Why is that? So I went back and looked at this 40-year period, really beginning in the 1970s onward, of what I call financialization. And this is basically the rise of the finance industry, not just the too-big-to-fail banks, but the shadow banks, the hedge funds, the mutual funds, private equity, uh, the entire kind of Copernican reorientation of, <laughs> of our society around the markets and finance. And what that has done, because I believe that that is why we are in a slow recovery, and I believe that the rise of finance has actually hurt business, which is where real Main Street pro prosperity comes from. So let's look at it from two perspectives. Um, first, um, your book focuses on what financialization has done mm. to business in general in, in the country. So let's talk about that. And then after that, I'd like to talk about the impact of financialization on ordinary working Americans. Yeah, for sure. So, so to take the first point, um, if you go back and step back and say, how are the financial markets supposed to work? Which, by the way, is something we didn't really do all that well uh, post-2008. The way that Adam Smith, you know, the father of modern <laughs> capitalism, right. set them up to work is that banks are supposed to take all of our savings, all the deposits that we put uh, into financial institutions, and they're supposed to lend those out to new businesses, to productive enterprises that then create jobs and employ all of us and uh, hopefully raise wages and grow prosperity. But over the last 40 years, that model has changed. So back in the early 70s, that's roughly what banks did. Since then, it's changed. And the killer stat, really, in my book is that only 15 percent of all the money washing around America's financial institutions actually gets lent to new businesses. The rest of it is existing in this sort of closed loop of speculation, of trading, of the creation of asset bubbles. And so it's no wonder that you've got the markets here and Main Street here. So there's no real productive capacity coming out of most, not, of most of that money. Not nearly as much as there was. So if you look at that 15 percent, that money that banks spent lending, that was about double in the 1970s, and it was the majority of their business in the earlier part of the 20th century. So banks have gone through a sea change, uh, I would argue really since the Carter administration onwards, um, because of some of the, the policy shifts that have happened. But if we, if we went back and spoke to the movers and shakers in the Carter administration, Reagan, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Clinton's administration, and, and so on, they would say that these moves that led to financialization would be great for American yes. business. So w how, is, how were they wrong? In what yeah. ways were they wrong? Well, I want to start by saying, you know, I don't think that policymakers were taking decisions that were, you know, um, venal or, or trying to do bad things. I think a lot of these ideas seemed good at the time. So if you go back to the Carter administration, for example, the 70s were the period, and really even the late 60s, were the period where um, underlying growth in America was starting to slow, right? So the post-war growth that we'd seen in the 1950s and 1960s was starting to slow. Why was that? Well, a couple of reasons. We had more competition from overseas. We had, you know, the rise of the rest, the emerging markets. You had Europe back on its feet. Um, and so you were at a normal sort of change point where we needed to look at 
what was happening on Main Street and say, how can we really support communities? How can we, what policies can we make? How can we uh, invest in infrastructure and in education in, in the hard stuff and supporting small businesses? Those things, of course, are political decisions, and they pit different constituencies against each other. Um, so all administrations, I would argue, since Carter onwards, actually took different decisions. They said, let's pass the ball to the market. So um, in 1980, you had the deregulation of interest rates right. for the first time. That was done in part to help um, people buy homes and, and be able to um, have variable interest rates that would change and not have them you know, locked into high rates. That was a good idea, but there were unintended consequences of all that. So deregulation of interest rates, of course, led to some of the exploding uh, spliced and diced CDOs that blew up the system in 2008. And the, the point is that nobody in, in this period of 40 years of policy shifts, deregulation under Reagan, uh, further de deregulation under Clinton, right. really looked and said, wait a minute now, how much of what's happening in the financial system is actually helping Main Street? We just said the markets will figure it out. The markets will tell us what's right. Well, obviously, um, the crash in 2008 had a profound effect on ordinary working Americans. But there have been other impacts that have come from financialization. Talk about that a little bit. Well, one of the fascinating things that I found in my book is that business itself has come to emulate finance. So if you, which is bizarre, right? I mean, you've got, you've got airlines that now make more money hedging oil than they do selling coach seats. Um, you know, you've got GE, America's biggest uh, original innovator, you know, founded by Thomas Edison, being a too big to fail bank in 2008 and only recently divesting their, their financial assets. Which I think most people don't realize. Which most people don't realize. No, right. in fact, Jeff Immelt, who's the head of that company, is, is trying to kind of make this interesting shifting of the Titanic with that company. And it'll be an interesting lesson to see if they can go back from being a taker to a maker again. Right. Um, so... That's one of the perverse effects. One of the many things I found fascinating is that the two big to fail institutions, they're not just banks, which we heard so much about, about a yeah. few years ago, are not only still too big to fail, but in many cases are even bigger than they were then. Yeah. How did that come to be, and, and what should we be doing about that? Well, if you think about it, you know, um, a number of institutions failed in 2008. The government helped the existing institutions who were remaining, you know, who remained to actually acquire some of those assets, making <laughs> them bigger. You know, right. I mean, it's it's this kind of perverse thing. Also, there were side effects. Private equity companies like Blackstone, for example, were able to come in when when the housing market crashed and buy up tons and tons of properties on the courthouse steps with, with no regulation about um, making some of those properties uh, affordable housing, ensuring that rents didn't go up in certain neighborhoods. So you now have a situation where um, Blackstone, a private equity firm, is the single biggest landlord in America, which is why you have neighborhoods like uh, in the Inland Empire, for example, in California, that area two hours in from the coast that was really hit hard in the crisis, you have unemployment rates that are higher than average, but you also have rents that are higher than average. Now, those two things shouldn't go together, but right. they do. We have, um, in case anyone hasn't noticed, a presidential election <laughs> <laughs> no. going on now. So I heard some things. <laughs> There are three remaining candidates. I mean, it looks like it's going to be Hillary Clinton versus Donald, Donald Trump, but Bernie Sanders is still in the mix. As you've um, looked at, at their economic uh, proposals, does any of them, do, do any of them have what you think of as a sound approach mm. to the economy in general and some of the specific problems you talk about in your book? So one of the things I think that's really interesting is the economy and the financial system and who it's working for and who it's not is the meta-economic theme. But each candidate, I would say, is just taking a kind of a small sliver of that. Um, so Sanders is saying break up the big banks. Well, right. that's probably a good idea, but we shouldn't think that that's a silver bullet to preventing crises because, as I say, there's this whole ecosystem that has to do not just with banks but shadow banks and private equity and housing policy and tax policy that we have to fix. So I feel that uh, his plan hasn't been as nuanced as it might be. Hillary, on the other hand, I think has a more nuanced vision of the overall uh, financial system and how it works. She wants to, though, work within the sort of existing Dodd-Frank financial regulation. And I also feel that she hasn't addressed actually some of the, the legacy issues from the 1990s under Bill Clinton and, and more particularly under Treasury Secretary Bob Rubin, some of the actions that were taken that actually contributed to the process of financialization. And she's probably going to have to address those at some point. 
Trump is, I mean, look, it's hard <laughs> to know what he's thinking from day to day, but it's interesting that, you know, his policies may be uh, nuts in some cases or, you know, not, not viable, not realistic, but he is touching an emotional core of something which resonates right. with people. This, we're going to renegotiate the free trade deals. Well, you know, it's true. I mean, American manufacturing did get hollowed out by some of those deals. You know, free trade used to be, um, you couldn't even have a conversation where you said, maybe we should rethink free trade. He sort of put that on the table. That's resonating with a lot of people. So all this is part of what I'm talking about. But whoever the next president is, I think needs to address this larger ecosystem problem of are the financial markets serving business? Are they serving society? Right. One of the things that we, we heard about um, that would help to get these financial institutions to do a better job serving society mm. was the uh, reimposition of uh, regulations, mm -hmm. that, they, that these, um, we would have uh, a firmer structure mm. uh, so that the financial outlets would be guided uh, more properly. Yeah. Reading your book, that seems not to have happened, even though we've heard a, a great deal about um, Dodd-Frank and, and other initiatives. Yeah. So what's real and what's not real? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. how do we stand when it comes to regulations right now? Well, one of the problems, and, and this is actually in the author's note of my book, one of the problems is how much um, power Wall Street has in Washington. Uh, Wall Street is generally swaps places with Big Pharma as the biggest financial donor to to, to Washington, six out of the top ten individual donors in this year's political cycle are hedge funders. So um, one of the reasons I decided to write this book was I actually had an interesting off-the-record conversation with a former um, Obama administration official about the handling of regulation and how it was crafted. And I made the point that um, on the uh, something called the Volcker, Volcker Rule, which was mm -hmm. one of the most contentious parts of financial regulation, it was supposed to split off trading from commercial lending, right. kind of you know the risky stuff from the plain vanilla stuff. Um, Ninety-three percent of all the meetings about that rule were taken with bankers themselves. <laughs> so it's not hard to understand why you come up with regulation that Swiss cheese when you have 93% of the meetings being taken with the financial So industry. there's the appearance yeah. of uh, new and uh, allegedly more effective regulations. Yeah. And then there's the reality because these regulations have been crafted Absolutely. by the very people who are supposed to be regulated. Well, that's right. And that gets into this idea of cognitive capture. I mean, I think that what worries me a little bit is I, I still feel um, that that we're not hearing enough from, um, f certainly not from Trump, but not from Hillary too, about how are we going to reorient the system so the financial markets are not the center of things. That's a kind of a mindset that finance is way up here and everything else should be orbiting. I think finance should just be a help meet to business and society. So when we hear all this, um, we don't just see it, we uh, hear it, we see it and, and cover it. There's all the discontent, um, the anger, um, from the constituents in, in the presidential mm. elections. There's the, there's the rise of Trump, that Bernie mm. Sanders has done much better um, than anyone expected in, in the beginning. People are upset, and they have reason to be upset. Indeed. Their standards of living are stagnant or declining and that sort of thing. What they really want are jobs. I'm yeah. absolutely convinced of this. Yeah. This 40-year period that you looked at, yeah. what's been the impact of the growing, increasing financialization on employment in this country? So this is one of the most startling uh, facts in the book. So from basically 1980 onward, as finance begins to grow in a line like this, uh, the number of new startups begins to flatten out and then fall. Um, the number uh, of sort of entrepreneurial ventures, the money going into to entrepreneurship, all these things that you, the U.S. prides itself on and that really makes our economy different from, say, uh, wealthy European nations. It's that ability to start businesses and create jobs, particularly small and mid-sized businesses, that starts to fall off as finance gets bigger. Um, and, it, you know, you just see finance starting to suck the oxygen out of the room. So today, the financial industry employs um, 4% of the country, basically, but it takes 30% of all the corporate profits. Wow. So if you want to look at you know, monopoly power, look right. at that. You wow. Know. And then when you talked about how financialization has affected businesses outside the finance community, um, it had an impact on um, unemployment there, too, because, yeah. I, I mean, we remember the downsizing craze. Obviously, Absolutely. a tremendous number of jobs were lost um, in, in the crash. But what's the relationship between, let's say, a company like uh, GE, mm -hmm. when Jack Welch was there, yeah. I mean, they, they got rid of tens of thousands of workers, but there were a lot of companies like that. Yeah. What's the connection between financialization and the loss of these jobs? So it's interesting. Um, financialized thinking basically encourages 
encourages corporate leaders to think only about the balance sheet. So there's, you know, this, this idea that you should marshal your capital, protect your capital. People, who cares? They can go wherever's cheapest. That's, that's why you get the sort of outsourcing of jobs you had. And that's why you get some of the risky um, outsourcing that creates problems like, you know, the Rana Plaza collapse in Bangladesh a couple right. of years ago, where, you know, you get these big companies putting jobs in places that are cheaper, but they have no idea what's going on because their supply chains get so complicated. So you get this short-term thinking, make as much money as possible as quickly as possible. But then reading your book, you find that these companies don't invest in their own product or in their own uh, company in ways that they that they did before. One of the things you've mentioned is that financialization is coming to the tech sector in, yes. a, in a big way now. Uh, what do you anticipate will happen there? Well, I think already you're seeing things that are happening that are not good for American innovation. So the lead of my book is actually Apple, um, because I tried to think of what is the most Kafka-esque <laughs> story that I could tell about the market, and, and Apple was what I came up with. So Apple is you know, one of the richest and most successful companies in the world. A um, few years ago, they began issuing billions and billions of dollars of debt uh, to pay back shareholders, to do dividend payments, and also do corporate buybacks, which is when a company buybacks, buys its stock back on the open market, which artificially jacks up the share price. Right. Uh, executives like that, big shareholders like Carl Icahn like that, because it makes them richer. Um, so they're borrowing all this money. Now, they have $200 billion <laughs> of money sitting overseas in uh, a lot of offshore tax havens. It is cheaper for them to issue debt, to create a debt bubble in the U.S., rather than bringing that money back wow. and paying the U.S. tax rate on it. Now, you could argue that that's a little rich for a company whose basic core technology, including Internet, touchscreen, GPS, was all invented by you know, DARPA, which is part of the federal <laughs> government. You, know, right. you could say maybe the government should be getting a cut of that. That's almost a separate issue. But it just shows you this bizarre cycle of, who are the markets working for? These are these tech companies are more involved in the capital markets when they don't need any capital. So well, you know what is this really about? One of my pet peeves is infrastructure. So oh, yeah. infrastructure in the U.S. is in sad shape. If we had a real, really a major rebuild America campaign, it would yeah. be a wonderful source of good, good new jobs, well-paying jobs, and that sort of thing. Because we have historically low interest rates, you'd be able to finance it totally. uh, in, in a great way. And yet we're not doing it. Everyone seems to agree on the right and the left that we need to get it done, yeah. but we're not doing it. Why not? You know, this is what Bob Reich, for example, in the Clinton administration was arguing for. But instead, you had the Rubin camp, you know, with the balance the budget, keep the interest rates low, private investment sort of strategy, which created the market bubble, uh, which eventually led to the dot-com crash in 2000, 2001. I would argue that that's kind of where we are now. Now, it's, it, the, the reasons are different. I think the reason we didn't have a huge infrastructure build, which every smart economist <laughs> practically right. says that's a no-brainer. You know, when interest rates are, are zero, of course you build roads and bridges and do things like that. Uh, but we had gridlock in Washington in 2008. So you had the Federal Reserve who was, you know, they were kind of the last men standing and now last woman standing, Janet Yellen, um, you know, feeling like, God, we've got to do something. We can't, if we don't, if we don't give some kind of stimulus to the economy, average people on Main Street are going to be in even worse shape than they are now. So the Fed comes in, uh, pump, you know, puts $4 trillion of money in the markets. You get the markets up here, but you don't get as much change in, right. in Main Street as you might see. And I think that that's where we are now. And I think the next president has got to address this. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the Fed, too. I mean, we've had these low interest rates. They've... Um, it's been hard for a layperson to tell whether they've been artificially low. Uh, it yeah. seems like we needed them at least for a period of time. Yeah. But the result has been a booming stock, stock market. Yes. So we've had this boom for several years now. The market is very high. Interest rates are very low. Is this something we should be concerned about? I think so. I mean, there's, there's a famous um, professor, Rajan, who used to teach at the University of Chicago, and he's now the head central banker of India, who said that low interest rates were kind of a palliative, like a Marie Antoinette, let them eat credit, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right. a solution to the decline, of, certainly of the working class and of the middle class as well um, in the last 20 years, 40 years and 20 years, respectively. And um, low interest rates are really the, the policymakers' way of putting a blanket over this underlying growth problem. And I happen to think that we're about at the end of this 40-year period of what monetary policy can do to really kind of goose the, the underlying economy.
So if, <laughs> so if we have another crisis, if you're right, what does that mean? Well, I think if we have another crisis, the Fed is just simply not going to have the. Yeah, ammo. where can the Fed go? They can go to negative rates. Rates are so low. <laughs> they can go to negative rates, but look at Japan. I mean, Japan is is in negative rates, except Japan is different because they actually own most of their debt. We don't own most of our debt. If we right. get rates that low. There could be a real reorganization of, you know, how the Chinese are, are holding assets in the U.S. I mean, you could see the global economy really shaken up, and it would be pretty devastating. So you have some suggestions yeah. uh, in your book, but if uh, I like to ask the magic wand question, if, <laughs> if you were in charge of the economy right now, what would be a, a handful of the things that you would do right away to try and get us back on, on the right track? Well, if I was the next president, the first thing I would do is in the first 100 days, I would give a, a narrative changing speech. So, you know, part of the problem is that we didn't really have the right narrative post-2008. We thought if we bailed out the financial system, everything else would follow from there. That's basically trickle-down theory. Trickle-down theory is broken. There has been very little evidence in the last 20 years that it's, it's worked. <laughs> How did it ever make sense in, in the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, this is the thing about economics. It's ivory tower. It was a theory. It was a theory. We tried it out. It right. didn't work. But, you know, these ideas get in into the, the canon of academe. And, and actually, that's, that's an interesting point, too, that so many classes um, in, in business schools and in Economics 101 are still teaching efficient markets theory. If anything, the last eight years have surely taught us that markets are not always efficient. Right. So if I, you know, if I were a policymaker, I would change that narrative. I would say, OK, you know what? The financial market needs to be doing something good and measurable for Main Street. We're going to make it do that. And if it's not doing that, we're not going to worry about saving bankers. We're going to worry about saving homeowners. We're going to worry about uh, having a national growth plan. We're going to worry about really investing in technology and infrastructure, as you say, doing the things that at a grassroots level will help grow. And what about regulations? Um, what kind of regulations would you I, impose or reimpose? I think we need, I would love to close some of the loopholes in Dodd-Frank. I mean, derivatives in particular are still just a nightmare. Derivatives are those uh, weapons of mass destruction, right. the financial destruction that Warren Buffett always rails about that caused the financial crisis. Um, the Gary Gensler at the CFTC, um, who's now Hillary's campaign finance manager, was, was able to push through some amount of regulation for those, but not all the way, because Treasury really pushed back and overseas investors pushed back. So really only, depending on who you believe, uh, only about 50 percent of the derivatives traded in this country are transparent. The rest of it, you can't even see what's on the books. You don't know who's holding the exploding bag. You Which know? is what got us in trouble. Which is what got us in trouble. In um, time for one more question, um, overall, looking ahead at the American economy, are you, are you optimistic or pessimistic? I have um, two competing theories right now, which I will, I'll share both with you. Um, I do think that we are in a period where financial, false financial growth, this kind of sugar high of the markets, is tapped out. And I think if something doesn't fundamentally change, that we'll be in for 30 to 40 years of lower equity returns, which I think will create great political crises, because this will mean that the baby boomers will be coming uh, to their retirement right. years at a time when the markets are not giving them what they thought they would, and the millennials who came of age in a job market that was so bad are going to be, they're going to be fighting politically for this shrinking share of the pie. That's going to be very contentious, I think. Um, I would say that I think there's an opportunity for a much deeper, bigger, new kind of labor movement right now. And I think that people are so upset about this process of financialization and stagnant wages across the board. The working class has been dealing with it for a long time. White collar is now dealing with it, right. too. And as everybody becomes Uberized and outsourced <laughs> and we have this new sort of social corporate compact, I think there could be a really interesting moment for people to come together and really say, why is the labor share of the pie not bigger? And, you know, we need to change that. I wish we had more time. Rana, thank you so much. The book is Makers and Takers. The author is Rana Fruhar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. A man carrying a gun was recently shot and wounded by a Secret Service officer outside the White House. A witness said the man was carrying the gun in plain sight and made no attempt to conceal it as he approached a Secret Service checkpoint. 
A crowd of sightseers looked on as a Secret Service agent hollered repeatedly for the man to drop his weapon. When he refused to comply, the agent shot him once in the chest, critically wounding him. On the same day as the shooting, presidential candidate Donald Trump appeared before a large crowd at the annual convention of the National Rifle Association. He argued that more people should have guns and they should be allowed to carry them in more places. Trump had previously said he wanted to do away with gun-free zones in schools. But with the NRA crowd cheering him on, he said he would get rid of such gun-free zones everywhere. According to Trump's logic, the more people who are armed, the safer people will be. Incidentally, the Secret Service, which is protecting Trump, upset some NRA members by refusing to allow any guns to be brought into the hall where Trump was speaking. That's all for now. See you next time.